All right, so we're going to design a price tracker like camel, camel, camel. Uh, it specifically looks like it's focused on just Amazon.com is what it tracks prices through. So it kind of is going to scrape it. This is taken from somebody's real uh, system design interview at Meta. Uh, I think they only do uh, system design interviews for E5 and above. So that means it's from a senior level round. Um, these are the requirements that I'm going to be covering uh, for my design is that uh, the users can subscribe to watching for a price drop. And then when it hits a certain price threshold, they'll receive an email notification. And then if we have time for it, I'm also going to have the price history feature. Um, they actually even had this nice little um, thing somewhere of um, here, read about our features. And um, yeah, so it's this is their main features, the price alerts. Okay, any questions before we go ahead and just dive into the diagram? All right, we can go ahead and do that. Um, so we will have um, users subscribing for a price update. Uh, we'll say subscribing to price alerts. There we go. And we'll also have this scraper that's going to run against amazon.com. I'm going to set up a thing for amazon.com. I like the color orange for external services. Can I see the orange? There it is. Okay. So we're going to have this and we're going to have it as amazon.com. And then we're going to have um, some scrapers that are, of course, going to be checking it for price updates. Um, yeah, we'll use this. So this will be uh, our scrapers. So it's going to have some similarities to our web scraper that was kind of modeled off of uh, Google.com. Um, and we're going to want to store um, the price uh, somewhere. We're going to need the price, and we're also going to need a data store for um, the price alerts. So there's going to be at least two different data stores that we're going to need. Um, let's go ahead and throw those on there. Oh, did I have three? Oh, giving me a little issues. OK. There we go. So this is going to be the price uh store and this will be the price um watch database it's the, the price watch e and then we'll have the um product price e so this will be what we have historically um so we have the scrapers over here they're gonna have some requests they're going to come in for what needs to be scraped and make that straight. Uh, so this is, again, going kind of similarly to the web crawler design is that we have this URL frontier. And so this is going to be similar to the URL frontier. Um, you'll take a thing off of the broker, take off one of the messages, and then you'll scrape that. And then you will write the new price over to product price DB. We should go over the schema for that in a minute. Now, how are we gonna figure out what needs to be scraped again? There'll be a thing that is just regularly looking for stale prices. It's like the stale price scanner is what we'll call it. Stale price scanner. So it's just some kind of um, cron job or something that runs every five minutes or so. And so it'll do a key range query for the oldest uh, updates. 
and we'll use that for determining what needs to be scraped again. Let's dig into the schema for this thing. So we're gonna have a bunch of different um, product, uh, say product ID, we'll have something like 5347. Let's use a, let's fix this font. Um, there we go. Okay, so we'll have some kind of product ID. You'll have the last price. And it'll be something like, let's say this one was listed for uh, 1950 most recently. And uh, that would be at a specific timestamp. We'll say it was last scanned at 167000 That's a Unix epoch time. And that is the last price that we saw. And so uh, let's say that the current time is time is something like one six eight zero 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 um, five thousand, and then um, uh, you would just go through. You just do key range query for the oldest timestamps. You pull that in, and anything older than a certain range, you'd push onto that broker for scraping again. Okay, so that kind of handles the scraper pretty well. Um, I'd imagine you would probably even want to do something more adaptive. And so you could even do um, a scrape interval. So there, there could even be a um, like how, how much you want it to go stale or something. You could have a, yeah, scrape interval. Well, so that wouldn't work if you're just having it always check to the oldest ones. And so then you would need to do, that would, that would require more of an analytical thing. Uh, but I mean, there's some stuff you can do for it, for making it do something more adaptive. Um, you would, yeah, yeah. You, you'd probably want to have this do change data capture over to an OLAP database and then do your analytical queries there. If you're going to do a time interval and pick up on everything stale off of that, um, maybe we can go ahead and come back to that later is, um, uh, uh, adaptive, uh, price change uh what is it um scanner rates scanner intervals uh google.com definitely does something like that um so we'll maybe come back to that at the end uh and then um so you also need to be subscribed to a price there's going to be users that are subscribed to prices uh so we can kind of model that in um uh, an ER diagram kind of thing is um, you would have, of course, you have users and you're going to have um, products. And so you have an end to end relationship over here. Um, let's just use a line like that. And we're going to say it is a end M relationship. So that means like ordinarily in, uh, in SQL, you would have a uh, join table for that. And so our join table is where we're going to store stuff, but there's going to actually be an attribute of this relationship, which is going to be the price threshold at which you would have the, the watch triggered. Um, let's maybe flesh this out a little bit more. So this is like in the browser, when a user sees a product, they want to watch, they're going to type in a certain price threshold and they're going to want to subscribe for that price. Um, so this is the price watch back end. So you're like, hi, this is the product ID. This is the price I want to watch. Um, and then, of course, it picks up on their user ID off of their uh, user token. Uh, you are going to do a write against the database, succeeds get a success back, 200 success. Yep, we will email you there. Um, and then it's entered into this uh, table that we're gonna have and it will have a price on it. It'll be a price threshold. Okay, so let's go ahead and have our schema for that. So you'll have your product idea that you're watching. So let's say that this user wanted to watch product 5347. The one that we had over here, uh, their user ID, uh, user ID, let's say that uh, their user ID is um, their user 23455. 
and they want to see that product drop to a price of 15.00. So price threshold would have 15.00. like that. So it looks just like a join table with an attribute on it. So you would probably have like a user database off somewhere else. Uh, you might have a, well, so we do have a product database off somewhere else. Um, and then this is the join table uh, for that. So you have that entry. And then of course, um, we want to have that notification go out. And so every time that there's a price update coming into here, I think that we are going to want to subscribe to it. Uh, let's go ahead and move this off somewhere. Um, yeah, so that it's not in the way. So we've got this. And um, so every time there is a price update, it's doing a new check. It's going to go over here. Uh, and then we can go ahead and do change data capture off of this. Uh, an alternative to this is to have a message broker in the front. Um, but uh, for change data capture, apparently DB triggers work just fine. Uh, that's from my conversation with um, Steve from Life Engineered. Um, so we have CDC, change data capture with DB triggers. So we're going to have this listening to it, and we'll have this uh, task runner that'll be watching. So it'll receive the price for that, and then it'll do a query against this to find all the users that it'll do a check for a given product ID, everyone that has a threshold that is um, higher than the new price will receive a notification. So we'll have some task runners. They're listening to, so it is the price notification, uh, price notify, notify, notifier, uh, price, price drop notifiers. Two hardest problems in computer science, cash and validation and naming things. Struggling with naming something. Okay, so we get the new price. Uh, we know what product it's for because it'll just be uh, the latest copy of one of the records. So we have that. And then we're gonna do a key range query using the values from that record for the price and the product ID. It'll be a key range query. And now we've got a list of user IDs. Let's go ahead and maybe uh, uh, talk through that a little bit, put it into a bit more text. Um, so we're going to do query with, um, we'll have the product ID, you'll we'll have the price threshold. Uh, so you would maybe want to do something other than a string for the price. You'd probably want to have it also as uh, an int. You can convert this into a dollar and cents int. So uh, you could also say, Another representation of this is um, 1950. And so over here, you would have that one as 1500. And so that's how you could do the key range query uh, more easily with that price threshold. Um, so you'll get back a list of turns, um, list of user IDs, and now you want to notify them. And so uh, you might have a separate user table. Well, so it you could have a list of like 100 users. Um, so this could be a lot of work. Um, so you might actually want to have, um, so Twitter has this like extra message uh, broker following. Uh, so whenever there's like a tweet sent, it gets a list of everyone that's listening to them. And then it makes a message for every single one of those users. And then it does a write operation uh, individually for each of those um, messages instead of trying to do one big um, series of um, write operations just off of a single task, which is probably um, not, uh, it, it would be a messier uh, retry scenario on that. It's, it's better to fan it out. So we're gonna go ahead and add a message broker. And so you'll have a bunch of messages, individual messages for um, 
Can I even rotate this? Is that a thing that I can do? Oh, wow. I haven't done that before. Okay. Yeah, so we have a list. We have a bunch of messages getting created off of that. So we can even do, oh, there's a message in the chat. Sorry. Um, I'll go ahead and address those after I'm done drawing this. Okay. Uh, all right. I see the first one. I see a couple of messages coming in here. Okay. Won't the DB be overhaul overloaded by the change data capture? There are like millions of stocks out there and you uh, and you need to track the price for each one of them every. Well, so I'd imagine that you don't need to actually update it every single second. I'd imagine that you could have it updated uh, every hour. So when I was going through some of the products on uh, Camel, 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 some of them were actually only getting updated like once a day. In fact, popular products. So I'd imagine that's the people that that's the ones that have the most people watching. You go over here and um, it's, uh, I guess sometimes it is getting a couple of updates per day, but for a lot of them, it was only like one update per day. So this one maybe is like more adaptive than um, maybe this one. Yeah. But I would imagine it's not running every single second. Um, we can do numbers at the end for trying to calculate how often we're going to be doing that. Um, and I, I had brought up um, adaptive price change intervals. Um, so you could even have it speed up. You could do a, another quick, if, if there's like a sudden drop, if you pick up a drop, you should maybe also check it again 15 minutes later and see if other sellers are reacting to that product drop. Um, so that's what I mean by an adaptive uh, intervals. Whenever you pick it up and there's actually a change that occurs, you would maybe want to pick up the interval again to scan again 15 minutes later. Well, if there's no price change and you're just continuously getting no price change for hours on end, uh, you can maybe slow down a bit or something like that. Um, okay. Um, but yeah, millions of millions of watching millions of things is is. Um, that is a concern. And so scaling numbers might be a fun thing to go over for this particular problem. Uh, let's go to our next question. Oh, I see. This is a, this is a good one. Uh, should we use consistent hashing? Maybe Cassandra, this could be, it'll, it'll definitely be, um, some of the keys will maybe be read heavy, but I would imagine that millions, I don't think that, I, I've never heard of camel, camel, camel before being asked to do this problem. So I'd imagine that it doesn't really have as much user base as Amazon. I don't think it has millions of users, but it does have millions of products. So it might actually be write heavy. I can agree with you there. Um, so uh, good call out though on um, what should we be doing with our schemas? What should be the partitioning keys here? Um, so I was thinking for uh, the price history. So when you're when you're doing the price watch and you're trying to do this query right here, you're going to be querying against a product ID. And if you don't want this to have a ton, if, if you can, um, you maybe don't want to have scatter gather on this query right here. So I was thinking you might want to actually have the partitioning key as the product ID on this one. We'll get to the other schema too. We'll get to the other schema too. Um, I'm feeling uh, the partition key on this one. And then you would have a sort key of the user ID. Um, yeah. Uh, if, if the volume, if the ratio of writes to reads is sufficiently imbalanced though, that um I don't know. I, I feel like there's there's probably enough reads coming off of this. I, I feel like there's gonna be a lot more reads occurring than writes in this particular case because it's going to be doing this scan right here every time there's a price change and it'll be checking if anyone meets the threshold. So I think in this particular case, uh you don't want to do scatter gather. Um this one is is actually probably gonna be read heavy. But for this one, this one over here, I think that one might be, yeah, okay. So you're gonna be doing these writes every time you do a scrape. 
And then how often do you really do a read? You just do change data captures. Probably it's it's probably Cassandra, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I was thinking for the price history, you'd probably even want to do change data capture again and have that off of a different database. You could even do an optimized uh, read view of it. You have a, a thing that's more optimized for that. And so for this, you could probably do consistent hashing. Um, I don't think, yeah, I, I can't imagine this table actually doing, well, okay, so what's the price scanner doing? This one is looking for the oldest timestamps. Well, so you want the timestamps to be, you don't want those timestamps to be on one. You definitely want the timestamps to be evenly distributed across all of them. Maybe you could, okay. Uh, yeah, you might want to do that like random trick for celebrities. Uh, consistent hashing is the way to go here, though. I think um, so. You'd want to you'd want to do something with consistent hashing. There's nothing that stands out as a great partitioning key here, so you might want to do the random number trick. I see more messages have come in. Maybe I said something really controversial and incorrect. <laughs> uh, that would be great. I like learning here. Um, okay, yeah, uh, and Cassandra is, is what I'm currently feeling. We're definitely gonna have to get through all of our messages in the chat. Uh, I did that one. Don't do consistent hashing for key range. Yes, yeah, so in, in general, well, so you, you can sometimes get away with it. You can sometimes, if the if the read volume is really really low, you can get away with it. But that's that's a very non typical case. Um, I realize I made a whole video about this and how you shouldn't do consistent hashing for key range queries. Um, and then it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than this. I did kind of generalize things in that video it's had. And I was like, well, if it gets, if it's that popular of a video, I can make it like 10 times longer and like really go into a bunch of nuances of it. But um, if the read volume is super low, you can probably actually get away with it. Um, and then um, you, if, 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 the, if the balanced write volume is lower for a single shard, is, is higher for a single shard, then uh, the total amount of key range queries, that's when it would still maybe make sense to do consistent hash and spike key range queries. Um, yeah, great call out there. I, I didn't even realize, I, did, I think I didn't even think of this case when I was, I was making that video. Is there a question on? Yeah, there's a question actually. Why do we need to use user ID as a sort key? I mean, there's a question on the message as well. Okay. Um, well, so it, it has to be a primary, your, your primary key has to be uniquely identifying. Um, and the partitioning key is not going to be sufficient to uniquely identify everything. Um, the partitioning key, there, there'll be multiple user IDs for each product ID. And so you can't have a primary key off of just the product ID alone. You will also need to have um, something else in order to make it uniquely identifying. Uh, this is uh, similar to a, a join table from uh, normalized SQL databases where you have, um, you know, there's a product table, there's a user table, you need to join them in an end to end relationship. And so the primary key would be the combination of both of those foreign keys. Um, so uh, this is half of the, this is one half of the primary key, and then this is the other half of the primary key. And um, one that has to be the partitioning key, one that has to be the sort key. Since we're doing key range queries with a product ID, I want that key range query to be served off of a single machine node. And so that is why the product ID would be a great choice is that then you should hopefully have the entirety of all users subscribed to that one product ID on a single machine node. And you can serve that key range query off of one machine. Um, and then you would add a sort key to make it uniquely identifying. Hope that answers your, your question. Let me know if that wasn't clear. I'm still curious because in the query pattern, we have mentioned that there we should be querying on price threshold as well. 
there'll be a price threshold as yeah yeah there there will um that one is definitely not going to be that would not help with uniquely identifying stuff at all um so that that is another attribute of the key range query but um i don't think it actually would really help with trying to distribute things evenly um yeah because a, a a product could a, a product's price changes all over the place, but these other two are going to be relatively static. Um, so if you if you went with the price threshold instead, it could be hopping between machines. Um, if it's the partitioning key, of course. Um, for the sort key, I mean, I well, okay. So I guess so. This can't be the partitioning key. The only other thing it could be within the primary key is the sort key, um, but that would not be uniquely identifying. It could be a secondary index. So we could also make this a secondary index. That would actually make sense. Um, yeah, but we don't want it to be the sort key because it wouldn't be sufficient to uniquely identify anything. There could be multiple products um, on that same, uh, on, uh, yeah, it would, it would not help with uniquely. Well, so it's, it's this, is, this is actually an aspect of the product ID. So it would, it would definitely not, further make uh, the primary key uh, uniquely identifying since everything with a given product ID would always have the same price. Or no, oh, no, 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 no. The price threshold's off of the user. Well, you can have multiple users that are watching for the same price threshold. So not be uniquely identifying in that aspect. Uh, yeah, you would, you'd have multiple records for the same product ID and the same price threshold. Okay, let me know if there's anything else I can clarify on that. Um, but it's uh, a secondary index would be a good fit there. Okay, to timestamp as we're tracking the last two to three prices. Um, that might I haven't actually seen that done before. I haven't I haven't really seen you. Well, so it's like you could maybe if, if you're if you're doing the scrapes fast enough. Um, these timestamps are only at a uh, millisecond granularity. And then if you're scraping fast enough, you could actually have multiple things for the same timestamp. I think you would probably still have the product IDs. You'd probably not do multiple scrapes for the same product ID at the same millisecond. So it would be a good choice in that aspect. Um, I should maybe go, I'll, I'll go back through the questions, then maybe we should return to this and think through it a little bit harder. Uh, why do we need user ID to be the sort key? Okay, I went through that one. Um, uh, so how are you storing? Okay, let's paste in all the questions I've got. I also see the one in the YouTube channel. I'm not ignoring you. I am watching that right now. Um, and here, how does price notifiers get triggered? Uh, have user ID as the sort key seems wasteful. If you're querying by price threshold, the DB needs to filter based on price. Okay, well, I so that's a. Uh, uh, another one going off of, um, okay, I went over this. It's, I need to return to that one um, for, for figuring out how I'm going to index this. Uh, so uh, you need it to be uniquely identifying, but um, yes, uh, you do want to narrow it down by price threshold too, which is why you'll have a secondary index, but you can't make this the sort key because it might not uh, uniquely identify the uh, records. Um, yeah, I got. I, I get what you're going for there, though. Um, okay, and then this is the only other remaining question. Um, so this I'm going to return back to. Let's go ahead and just paste this one at the bottom, since that one's kind of the trickiest. Is figuring out how the heck to do our partitioning sort key for that database. Um, how are you storing the price watch DB? Would it update the existing price or would it add a new entry?
Well, uh, so you just add a new entry every single time that somebody um, subscribes to a new thing. This is not what's getting updated uh, when you do a scrape. It's the product price that gets updated when you do a scrape. And then um, you might be asking about this database and said you might have mis mixed up the, the, the um, things I said. Oh, I know what else I needed to do here. I also wanted to have a status and then it was um, so that way it wouldn't um, try and make multiple records while it's um, scraping. Uh, so you, you check uh, the database for things in the scrape status that have the oldest timestamps you pick them up and you put them onto the broker and then you set them into a pending scraped status. So that way when you do another scrape and those ones are still in the pipeline, you're not gonna pick them up again and have multiple scrapes go through for it. And then when the scraper finishes scraping that message, it'll go ahead and write it over here and flip the status back from pending scrape back to scraped from uh, uh, and it'll update the timestamp. Okay, so if we're going to be updating it like that, Cassandra, um, Cassandra's maybe not such a great choice. Um, unless we're always using, well, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, we don't want to use Cassandra for doing that because it has the tombstone operations. Um, this would be write heavy, which makes it really weird um, if we do the in place updates. We could maybe do. Cassandra, and then it would be like CDC to a OLAP database table. I'm I'm feeling DynamoDB right now though. Yeah, you could, I, I'm feeling DynamoDB just because we're doing an update in place, which doesn't play very well with um, LS entries in the tombstone operation. Um, yeah, I can, you know, I'll show you what I was thinking about with that OLAP table. Um, if you're going to do the fancy adaptive rate, you might want to do just copy this. And then we got this over here. And so you have your line. Okay, uh, let's move this one up over here. And then we have our price scanner. It'll be up over here. And it's not going against that directly. We're gonna have an OLAP table over here. And then uh, we would have um, change data capture over to an OLAP table. So then this one would be OLAP, and then this one would be Cassandra, and that could have the old records, and you could even have something fancy on um, a task runner between it that um, looks at whether the price has actually changed or something. Um, so that's one other fancy thing you could possibly do um, for when you're doing the, the adaptive rate, since you're going to have to subtract the last. You, you would um, maybe have the next scrape timestamp. You could do a calculated next scrape timestamp. And then this one would be a, doing a check for the next scrape timestamp. Um, so let's go ahead and write that. So that my verbal reasoning here is um, actually recorded on the diagrams. Have it like that. So that's another thing that we could do if we're going to do the adaptive rate. And then you could even have um, something over here that's doing the calculation for uh, it's the next scrape calculator. And we can move this further up to give ourselves more space. Let's stick that there. We're going to do this. I don't know if I'd really do this in practice in the real world with the, the OLAP table. This is kind of high on complexity. Um, I just I was I was kind of spitballing on an idea there, and I wanted to make sure that I at least recorded it. Uh, but I think this one's a little bit more realistic. And then um, so over here you'd have OLAP, which is you could use Redshift 
Um, if you're just calculating the next scrapes time scamp that, though, you don't need redshift to maintain the materialized view of the next scrape timestamp. You would just be able to stick with um, DynoDB or something. Or um, I don't even know if you need DynoDB. You could even, maybe we'd be able to get away with PostgreSQL over here. Uh, it might be, that would, that'd be a great idea to go over with um, numbers towards the end if we have time. Um, and then over here, it'd be Cassandra. And we could use this one also for creating the, um, the uh, price history. And that could be CDC off to somewhere else too. Or maybe there'd be a fancy way we could do it just directly off the DB instead of having another um, read optimized view. Cassandra might be able to be the read optimized view itself. Uh, okay, let's make sure I'm still getting through all these questions though. Um, how are you storing, uh, it update the existing price or would it add a new entry? Yes, that's what I was addressing. So this one is updating in place and that's why DynamoDB might be better than Cassandra there. Um, if you will add a new entry, you will update, searching has to be fast. So we'll need some good indexing. Yeah, yeah. So if it's just append only, LS entries are good. That's that's what I was getting at. Um, how does price drop notifiers get triggered? Uh, change data capture with a DB trigger. Um, yeah, DynamoDB actually has DB triggers. I've seen this done in practice with a thousand TPS before in production in a fan company. So you can get away with that. Uh, in fact, I, I was, I, was, I even had, I was like concerned if that was actually a good idea, and I talk to um, Steve from the Life Engineered, who's a principal engineer, and he actually was like, yep, thumbs up, that's, you can do that. Um, DB triggers on DynoDB at 1000 TPS, yep, you can do that. Um, for the same product, uh, do we need multiple entries per user in price watch DB? Why not store user to price relation in a separate DB for the same product? Um, do we need multiple entries per user? Yeah, well, so if a user is uh, subscribed to multiple products, uh, then you would inherently need to have multiple records for that user ID. I'm not sorry, user to price relation. Um, well, so you'd still need to have some kind of UUID to, um, you, would, you would still need to have then an ID of these two things combined and then you would stick it off somewhere else it would um uh you would it would it would not actually really save a ton of space and then when you're doing this key range query to look up all the user ids you would then have to do another query against another table where um i i can show you what this will look like i can show you what this will look like so you would still need to have uh let's zoom in So you would still need to have a, uh, we'll call it a relation ID of, um, we'll say one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, uh, 67. And so you have that ID, and then you would have another table, which is the um, price threshold table. You'd have the um, price uh, threshold. And then it would just store a mapping from the relation ID to the uh, price that you wanted. So we'll stick that over here. And then it's just a primary key of the relation ID. And then you would just have the um, price threshold of uh, 10.00. So I think it's, if, if you have an, an attribute that's specific to your join table relationship, I think it does actually make sense to store it directly on the join table. Um, I haven't done database normalization in a while, but I think that might actually be a good idea. Um, but then of course, when you're going in NoSQL land, you usually do denormalization as well, but this is what I think you would end up with your denormalized view of things. Um, so I think this does, it, it's, I, I think my approach over here might make more sense than trying to um, store those in separate locations. 
Uh, do I have any other unanswered questions? Sort key to type. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, this thing. How in the heck are we going to partition this thing? How in the heck are we going to sort this thing? Um, now I'm starting to wonder if this was actually a good idea to do the adaptive rate. Uh, God. So you have, if you have millions of products and you're updating each one once per day, how often would you be doing write operations? And then if you're updating each one, if you have some that are updated 10 times per day, how bad would that look? So if we have millions of, I'm gonna line off the questions from my math. So you have millions of products updated at once per day. So there's 100,000 seconds in a day. And so if it was 1 million products at once per day, that would end up at a 10 TPS. If you have 10 million, so millions does not mean one. So if you have 10 million products, that is 100 TPS. And then if you have 10 million at uh, 10 uh, times per day, it would be 1000 TPS. And so that's a lot. Um, I, I'm pretty sure some of the products let me pull up some of the other ones that didn't have crazy graphs like this that were updated all the time. Um, if I look at this one, oh, hello, no, no. Oh, I see, I'm, I'm not zoomed in to the one month. I'm not zoomed into one month. That would maybe, yes. So when I zoom into one month, it doesn't look like that was probably, I'm pretty sure most of these are not getting updated more than once a day. Um, let's go back to popular products and look at this one again and zoom it into one month. So I was under the impression that each of these squares was one day for some reason. Um, yeah, so here you go. It's it's not even updated more than once per day. I was like, there's no way this little website that I, I it's, it's probably not actually a, a little website. That's probably a, a horrible thing to, uh, it's it's probably not that small, um, but it, I was like, there's no way something like this is doing 1,000 TPS for however many customers it has. I don't even know how it's making money. Um, so it's probably still right heavy, but it's not quite as horrendous as we thought. Um, let's go back to our problem. Um, I feel a lot less horrible about Maybe, okay, so you, you should just go ahead and partition my product ID, I'm thinking. Or, or yeah, let's maybe partition by product ID. You, you don't want to partition by timestamp because then all of your writes are just hitting the one node. Um, and then if it's write heavy, again, that means that your scatter gather you can probably get away with. Um, or you, you might even have a PostgreSQL database here. Um, so it's, uh, which would mean that you don't even have to have a partitioning key, um, but your primary key will at least, well, okay, product ID is probably your primary key. Yeah, I don't think you really need anything other than that. So you just need the product ID. While for, in our other case where we had the Cassandra setup, you would probably need a sort key of the timestamp in order to keep it uniquely identified. And that would be assuming that you're not doing um, products at different rates, then that would mean that you wouldn't have a celebrity issue. And then up at um, this one, you can just go ahead and use that as it's, it's the primary key at least. Um, and a partitioning key. And you wouldn't need to have a sort key if your partitioning key is uniquely identifying all the records. Okay, I think I had more questions come in. Um, I should check. Oh, okay, you didn't know what CDC stand, stood for. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. 
user ID as I'm trying to figure out where my place was in um, the Discord chat. So how are you storing in the update existing price or new? Okay, I answered that. User ID is the sort he would be. Okay, I answered that. For the same product, do we need multiple entries per user? No. Say the scrapers fail to update. Say the scrapers fail to update the status of the items in the product price DB. How do you deal with items in the DynamoDB with pinning scrape that have already been scraped? So this is a partial failure scenario. You fail to update the status of the items in the product price DB. How do you, so if, if you fail to do the right operation, it should actually do a retry of everything. It should just go ahead and re-scrape and then do the right. That's usually how you have these things set up. Um, if it continues to fail, that's when you can talk about having a, uh, a dead letter queue, for example. Like let's say that a product gets delisted and then, um, then you would um, of course not be able to scrape it at all. And then of course you would also not do the, the rights of the product. And so it would be perpetually in a pinning scrape state and you would also have it in this dead letter queue. It shouldn't happen enough that you would have this like packed dead letter queue of um, products that got delisted. Um, I can go ahead and do a drawing of a dead letter queue here. So we got uh, this thing over here. And then, um, so you're trying to do the scrape and it, uh, and maybe it's successful and then you fail to do the right operation. It could be that the node failed completely, in which case it would be a retry, but if it fails to do the right or it fails to do the scrape, then you could possibly have this um, dead letter queue. We'll go ahead and name it DLQ. Uh, that's a common abbreviation for dead letter queue. And so then you would do a write over here and the task runner, I believe, does have to do the right operation. Um, I believe that's the one that does the right. Um, yeah, and then an engineer would just manually debug. Why in the heck is this this thing in the dead letter queue? Why did this operation fail? Uh, but um, I would say that retries should probably get there. Good question, though. I, I agree with that. Um, they say that junior engineers design entirely for the happy path while senior engineers design for the end of the world. Uh, so thinking about partial failure scenarios is pretty crucial for getting to uh, at and above the, the senior engineering level. Uh, yeah, really good question. Uh, any other questions before I try to dig into some other aspects of the design? Cool, all right, I'm gonna keep going then. Um, Cause I only got to this part, uh, that's where I left off. Let's go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and copy paste this all the way to the bottom. I'll show you guys how it currently looks. So this is what I started with. I showed the OLAP over here and um, I talked through dead letter Q over here. This was me talking through the price possibly being in a different table and then I'm gonna just copy and paste this. And then we can keep digging into um, the actual notification part. So we want to have uh, a thing for a user receiving a price drop alert. Receiving uh, price drop alert. You would have uh, a notification service. You can just use SNS. I'll go ahead and show how to roll your own though. Um, so I'm kind of doing two problems and one is notification and then, uh, yeah. So you can have SNS and um, that simple notification service. And um, you would probably need to have a task runner pulling off of the message queue. 
because uh, message queues, uh, message brokers don't do uh, push off. You have to pull things off of it. And then it would go ahead and pass it over to SNS. Uh, and then you can either have at most once or at least once. I'd assume that you would probably have um, at most once delivery in this case for the emails. And then here they are receiving their, their uh, email. Okay, let's go ahead and roll our own uh, notification service. So facing it again, because I feel like a lot of the times this would be acceptable enough to just have uh, SNS as your notification handling thing. But um, I've heard of um, interviewers where just using um, Lambda for uh, cron jobs, treated cron jobs is not enough. So sometimes you'll just get somebody that's a little bit crazy. Um, I think at Facebook, they, they, they like to do things like that, where no, you can't just use Lambda for, for distributed cron jobs. That's not good enough. Oh, we got a question. What's the mechanism for ensuring that recipients are not receiving duplicate alerts? Well, so it's, you, you, um, you cannot have exactly once delivery unless you do something similar to um, the auth capture workflow for, for um, payment services. Um, I had a video called Payment Gateway that talked through how to do that a little bit, but you can also look at Square's documentation where I figured out how to do that. Um, so um, uh, for delivery, um, it's either um, at least, at most once, um, but uh, if you can control things on the client side, then you can do deduplication. Um, but for deduplication on client side, if you have access to that, uh, you can do something similar to, it's called auth capture workflow. And I think it was actually from uh, Stripe's documentation. Had something really good for that. Um, yeah, they have like a whole page about off capture workflow, and it's it's um you would you the 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 idea behind it is that you basically just have a UUID that you generate somewhere, and you have that in your you store it in your database, and then you have a or queue or something, and then you send it with your message, and then you just do at least once delivery. You do at least once delivery, and then if you have the same UUID received by the the user. The second time, their uh, client software would just not do the actual alert. Um, so, uh, for push notifications, for example, if if it, if the Android uh, SDK supported a UUID with push notifications, you would use that. And then the second time, it sees a thing hit the device and it has the same UUID that's seen before, it would just not have it light up on your phone and get displayed. Um, it's that, yeah, the idea is item potency. Yeah. Ah, good question. And um, I'll show you how to roll your own for ensuring that it is um, at most once delivery. Um, usually, if it's not something non critical, um, so non critical as in like somebody's life doesn't depend on this, it's just some dude that wants to get a deal on a, on a product. Uh, so then you probably don't want to have at least once because that can result in flooding someone's phone. Um, so we have this task runner, it comes in. Um, and we can have a, where would we generate the UUID here? Where do we want to, so you have a notification and so it'll have a user ID, you'll have a product ID, you have a message ID, UUID that you generate, and this could be, this could be used for deduping it. and. Okay, yeah, you could use that for deduping it and maybe like the current date. Um, sure. Or when you're writing the record over to the price, the product price DB, you could generate a UUID there, but then under the retry scenario, that would mean that you would still have multiple records generated. Um, I guess you could just use the user ID and product ID and then um, try and dedupe it a bit off of um, the range of uh, like like the current date. Um, 
or something like that. Yeah, okay. So you have that, it's coming in, user ID, product ID. You want to alert them of the product ID hitting their threshold. Um, so uh, it comes into the task runner, sends it over to your notification service. And then, oh, okay, I remember how to do this. So you're rolling your own notification service. And you're going to want to have a data store. It's gonna have a status on it. And you write to your data store right before you actually do the send. And then you also write after the send. Um, well, so after the send would be if you're trying to do at least once. I guess in our case, we only have to do it once. And so you would do a check, you would do a read off the data store and then you would write to it and then you would do the send. So uh, it would be the D dupe DB. So I guess we can call it. Um, so first, uh, well, okay, let's talk about the schema. We're going to have um, user ID 5367. We'll have um, the product ID um, 5347. And we can look at the timestamp, 67005000. Since I guess you can have like multiple instances of a price drop, you could dedupe it by also looking at um, whether it's, uh, you've already sent a notification about this within the last three days. And so then it would be um, at most for the last three days. And then if something somehow gets retried more than three days later, I feel like that's a bit more forgivable as a, uh, you know, duplicated message. You, your goal is just to not hit their phone with 10 notifications in under a minute from how it usually works with at least once. And this would definitely achieve that. Um, if you had a second message occur several days later, I, I feel like that is somehow forgivable. Um, but again, one, read, check you haven't already attempted it. Uh, and then right before you do the send, you want to do a write, and then you do the send. So let's go ahead and put that into steps. One, check the record isn't already there, which would indicate that you're doing a retry right now. Um, and so this would make sure, so if, if, if you did the send and then you failed, the node failed right after you did the send, then it would probably try and do a retry of this task runner or something. And then when this one does that read, you'd see that record there and that you've potentially already sent one. And so then that would just kill steps two and three. Two, um, create the record. And then three, send the notification. And then um, if, you, if you have, um, if you can control the client logic, um, you would just have a status instead, and then um, you would do a write after the send for deduping instead. Um, but then you would, well, so it's, it, you would do a status update, which would, um, I mean, it's not entirely necessary. Um, I guess you wouldn't necessarily have to have the status there, but it could possibly save some efficiency or something. Um, I guess you should probably just leave off the status part completely and you would just go ahead and let it flood and dedupe on the client side. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So we've rolled our own notification service too, though. Any questions? I'm pretty happy with what we've covered already. Any questions before we end the stream? Cool. All right. I'll let you guys go then. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, I'll see you next time. See you guys. Thank you.